My good friend, Dr. Atik Rahman, Chairman of this session, Secretary of the Ministry, Government of Bangladesh, my very good friend, Dr. Salimul Haq, Dr. Ian Burton, Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen and colleagues. Let me at the outset express my deep gratitude uh, at being given this opportunity. To be quite honest, I never really uh, foresaw the scale and the size of this remarkable gathering and the extent of enthusiasm that clearly underlines all that you've been doing in the last few days. And I'd like to express my compliments and my congratulations to both Atik and Salim for having put together such a, a wonderful institutional innovation in a field which unfortunately worldwide is still being neglected and where it is being given any attention, it's essentially on the basis of a lack of understanding or information. And therefore, I think, as Salim rightly said, uh, this is one place where you not only have had exposure to field action and initiatives, but are also bringing together the analytical components of what needs to be done. Um, I would also like to salute the work of BCAS and the new center that Salim has taken up responsibility for. I've been going through the material that's been provided and it's very impressive, quite apart from the enormous emphasis that's been placed on adaptation measures uh, by these two gentlemen um, who have been at it uh, with an enormous amount of dedication for quite some time now. Uh, the very fact that you're also training people from other parts of the world ensures that your experience, your insights, and your knowledge will be uh, shared by a much larger community for the greater good of humanity. I think the points that have been made about scaling up, linking up, and ensuring that we really spread out and create a network of activities to uh, ensure that our efforts and our experience don't remain confined only to the excellent work that's being done in Bangladesh, <coughs> but reaches out is all very laudable. I was very also, I'm also very happy to learn from the Secretary about the work that's being done by the government. And I think all of us around the world have much to learn from these initiatives. Uh, I, I'm, I'm delighted that the next uh, gathering will take place in Vietnam because I think that will also give you a diversity of insights and experience all of which will enrich um, what we need to do in the future. Now, I was asked to concentrate on what we are doing in the fifth assessment report um, of the IPCC, which is well in hand, and the colleagues over here who are involved in that effort. Um, I'd like to particularly uh, uh, acknowledge the presence of Dr. Chris Ebai, who is head of the TSU for Working Group 2, wherein lies the major responsibility for work in this area. Uh, and we have an exciting task on hand, and a large number of scientists from all over the world are tackling that with enormous enthusiasm and dedication. Uh, however, what I would do with your indulgence is not to go into the details of the outline of what we are attempting in the fifth assessment report, but essentially deal with some generic issues that would feed in, I believe, to the whole structure of what we are trying to do in the fifth assessment report. Now, in uh, giving you some 
uh, exposure to what I believe needs to be taken into account, I'm going to put forward a plea and request all of you who are so active in this field to publish as early as possible, as extensively as possible, uh, the benefits and the fruits of your work. Because in the fifth assessment report, we have a short window of opportunity where we can access material that's published. And everybody knows that in the field of impacts and adaptation, we have a long way to go in filling up the gaps that exist in our knowledge, particularly in different regions of the world. So the sooner you publish something, uh, the greater you would be helping the cause of science and the work of the IPCC, particularly in respect of the fifth assessment report. Uh, let me uh, highlight a few things that came out of the fourth assessment report. Uh, we clearly identified the fact that there are regions in the world that are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And obviously, adaptation measures have to be in consonance with the extent of vulnerability in different parts of the world. And here, it's particularly important, therefore, to see that when we look at vulnerability, of course, we have a fair amount of experience, understanding, and information on what has happened in the past. But what's going to be critically important, if we have to ensure adequate capacity for dealing with adaptation, that we clearly estimate and try to provide substance to vulnerability in the future. And this would obviously require a great deal of rigorous work to come up with an assessment of climate change, its magnitude, its scale, and the manner in which it's going to manifest itself in the future. And on that basis, we should be able to come up with a much better understanding of how vulnerability is going to change in different parts of the world, because that's the basis on which we would be able to design capacity and action to deal with adaptation and the challenge that this would provide. Um, we know, as the fourth assessment report clearly pointed out, that adaptation can reduce vulnerability. And therefore, this becomes an extremely important objective and element of adaptation measures. Whatever measures we devise must clearly target uh, the important objective of reducing vulnerability. Uh, so, you know, while this would in most cases happen by itself if the, the adaptation measures are designed appropriately, but if we were to explicitly take into account the fact that we're not merely talking about physical actions that would somehow minimize the impacts of climate change, but we're also trying to reduce the vulnerability, and this would require a whole variety of initiatives, then clearly we would be making the best use of initiatives that we take in hand. Um, the third aspect that I'd like to highlight as coming out of the fourth assessment report is the whole issue of adaptive capacity. And we know that adaptation has been going on in several communities around the world for centuries, if not longer. Uh, and you've seen this firsthand, I'm sure, through your field visits that were undertaken as part of this conference. Uh, but we also know that with the impacts of climate change in the future, the capacity which often has been adequate in the past and has served us very well may turn out to be totally inadequate in the future. So if we really want to improve this adaptive capacity and to see that it matches the extent, the magnitude and the level of impacts that we're going to face in the future, then we must understand what constitutes this capacity. 
because if we don't have a full understanding of what this capacity represents, what this species called capacity for adaptation really is, we might fall short of creating it in seeing that we are resilient and are able to deal with the impacts that we're going to face in the future. Well, capacity is intimately linked with social and economic development. And therefore, whatever we do in terms of social and economic development initiatives must clearly mainstream the need for enhancing capacity to deal with the impacts of climate change. We also know that capacity is not evenly distributed. And there, of course, we are linking it up with vulnerability. As it happens, and I'm sure this is something that's been repeated several times, unfortunately, the least capacity often exists in the most vulnerable communities and the most vulnerable locations in the world. So we would have to come up with a clear assessment, a definition, an understanding of what would constitute appropriate capacity to deal with the impacts of climate change, and then we would be much better equipped to create it. And this would require a very explicit and focused treatment for different sectors of the economy and for different sets of activities. And that would include water, agriculture, infrastructure and settlement, on which incidentally we had a meeting, expert meeting, just a few days ago in Kolkata. Uh, health, tourism, transport, and the energy sector. All of these have been elaborated on in the fourth assessment report and our intention is to go much deeper and wider in the fifth assessment report. Um, let me deal with a few generic issues, as I said, and perhaps highlight a few key considerations when it comes to local capacity building. And I want to compliment the organizers of this conference on keeping in focus the importance of local action. Because as everybody knows, while mitigation is something that would be meaningful only if we were able to tackle it on a global basis. After all, greenhouse gases mix throughout the atmosphere and any action taken by one community or one country is certainly not going to help very much in creating uh, a reduction in the emissions and concentrations of these greenhouse gases across the atmosphere unless this is done on a global basis. But in the case of adaptation, indeed we do need uh, initiatives, policies, and an appropriate framework for ensuring adaptation uh, at the global level, at the national level. But the action will necessarily have to be centered around local initiatives. Now, in this, uh, regard, may I say that we will have to come up with some priorities and these priorities will vary from one location to the other. If one looks at the situation in Bangladesh that certainly uh, is very different from the situation that exists for instance in the Himalayan range where adaptation measures would be required of a very different kind and the capacity that we create would have to be very different. But in both cases there is a commonality and that commonality consists of the importance and primacy of local action. So we need to prioritize what needs to be done to create capacity at the local level because in the absence of that, whatever efforts we put in, whatever allocations are made of resources could be utilized suboptimally. And given the urgency of action and the paucity and inadequacy of resources that are available for this work, it is critically important that we optimize 
the benefits from actions that are taken. So I think this goes to the heart of what Salim said, that we need a great deal of analysis. Action uh, taken perhaps in the wrong direction uh, is, is, is not going to help very much. And therefore, we shouldn't be misled by merely believing that adaptation is in hand. And we should ensure that the adaptation measures we pick up and implement and the capacity we create to deal with this challenge uh, is in the right direction. In a very different context, I've often used uh, an extremely profound statement by Mahatma Gandhi. And what he said this was in a different context, but when I talk about our enormous uh, and overriding emphasis on GDP as a measure of human welfare and the human condition, <coughs> I invoke Gandhi's saying <coughs> when he said, speed is irrelevant if you're going in the wrong direction. I mean, what's the point of uh, measuring economic welfare purely in terms of GDP when we know GDP has some major flaws. Uh, so here again, in the case of capacity building and adaptation measures, we need to be very explicit in the kinds of priorities that we must identify and tackle. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, also Thanks. Thanks very much, Ati. Okay. I'd also like to highlight the importance of um, uh, trying to analyze the typology of adaptation measures. And here, while the action and the center of initiatives will have to be at the local level, as has been brought out, and I read some of the abstracts uh, in this conference, and as was said earlier by uh, as well, uh, we have to look at not merely uh, initiatives at the local level, even though they would, anything we do has to be centered uh, on local communities. We must look at policy initiatives at the national level and perhaps at the sub-national level and how these can facilitate measures that need to be taken. And I could give you a few examples. Adaptation and the capacity to adapt may require investments in infrastructure. And often this would be beyond the capacity of local communities to be able to uh, realize, simply because the resources that may be required would have to come from a higher level. Local communities, particularly those which are extremely poor, will be in no position to mobilize resources that are required for investments. For instance, if you take the case of Bangladesh, if you were to invest in a dike structure along most of the coastline, it would be impossible for a country such as Bangladesh to be able to mobilize even a small fraction of the financial resources that would be required. Uh, so I think we need to look at facilitating frameworks and actions at every level. We know that uh, often um, to adapt to the impacts of climate change, we would need knowledge which may require seeking inputs uh, from outside the community. Um, I can give you a very concrete example in the year 2003, there was a terrible heat wave uh, in a part of one of the states of India called Andhra Pradesh, which is in the southern part of, of India. Uh, and this heat wave lasted about 27 days. Normally, a heat wave of that severity, most of the information that we have, uh, suggests that it doesn't last anywhere beyond two to seven days. But on that occasion it lasted 27 days and there were about there were about 4,000 recorded deaths as a result. Um, 
the number could have been much higher because not every uh, death is recorded in places like that. Well, I was asked to chair a committee to look into this issue by the Chief Minister of uh, the state and to suggest what could be done in the future. And we were appalled to find that people at the local level did not even know simple things like oral rehydration therapy. And it was, of course, also a massive failure that there was no early warning provided. Each one over there either listens to the radio or the television uh, channels which are spread all over the state. But these media were just not used to spread information and provide warning of what was coming. Now, this is where I think you need initiatives beyond the community. And I think it's important for us to see that we clearly identify the typology of actions that would be required by different actors in this process. We also need a system of incentives and disincentives. Communities would be very sensitive to those and they would respond to a set of incentives and disincentives. Simple case is protection of forests and biodiversity or for that matter protection of mangroves. Uh, if there are appropriate incentives and disincentives, clearly we would be adding to the capacity and the ability of local communities to deal with uh, the threat of vanishing mangroves. So I think we need to identify some of these measures as well uh, and to see where it is that responsibility for these measures must, must lie. Uh, regulations are another area where perhaps adaptation measures can be facilitated greatly. A simple thing like uh, rainwater harvesting. If there were regulations at the national, sub-national or local level, uh, it would uh, greatly assist any initiatives that are taken by communities themselves. As a matter of fact, they could be a trigger to have communities move in that direction. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, we also have to build in the infrastructure, the capacity and the systems for early warning, particularly when it came to uh, disasters of various magnitudes. So um, it is important for us particularly those who are working in the field, to see that the rich experience and knowledge and information that we generate is utilized for adequate analytical work and uh, analysis of various kinds by which we would strengthen uh, adaptation measures and capacity at every level of society. Uh, of course, going up to the international level. And I might mention that uh, I'm at least convinced that if we want action at the global level, it has to be driven by knowledge. And that knowledge must have a sense of realism, must have a rigor, and must carry a level of conviction that could make a difference to the global community. Uh, the last set of points I'd like to make uh, are essentially already taken care of, and uh, Salim mentioned this, we shouldn't lose sight of mitigation because there are clearly synergies between adaptation and mitigation. As a matter of fact, the synthesis report of the AR4 says this in very simple terms, both synergies and trade-offs exist between adaptation and mitigation options. And we need to identify these, and we need to make sure that we provide adequate attention to mitigation in whatever we do with respect to adaptation measures. We should also look at the synergy with development. After all, uh, every society is concerned with economic development uh, in a range of sectors, in a range of situations, and I think the analytical work we carry out must focus 
on the synergy with development activities because adaptation measures would become that much more effective and their appeal would be that much more enhanced if we could embed them within the overall rubric of development activities. We also have to look at synergies uh, in respect of disaster prevention because it's not merely uh, impacts that are steady, smooth, and easily predictable. We also have to look at the probability of disaster events and ensure that whatever capacity, whatever initiative we take in, in capacity building and initiative we, uh, and, and actions we take in hand, uh, have a clear identification of synergies between uh, those measures as well as disaster uh, prevention. I, I'm very impressed, may I say, with uh, the initiative you are taking with Google Earth because this would be an extremely effective way of spreading access to understanding and awareness on this subject. So um, I, I think um, this is a remarkable gathering. I don't know of any other place in the world where we've institutionalized this kind of a get-together of those who are the most active and most dedicated professionals working in the field of adaptation. And I would once again like to compliment both Atik, Salim, and those who have been working with them. Uh, and there's a large number because they've obviously created an enormous uh, fund of human support and, uh, and inputs, uh, which is clearly demonstrated by the participation of such a large number of persons from all over the world. So thank you for giving me this opportunity and may I wish you all the best in your endeavors in the years ahead. We certainly have a long way to go but do remember, we count on this community to provide us with the knowledge in published form that would essentially serve your overall objectives if we're able to bring out a strong fifth assessment report that is rooted in the experience, the knowledge, and the insights that you have the benefit of having created. Thank you very much.